Well, you're, it's, actually, it's really nice. It's not my show, it's yours, so I can just let you talk. <laughs> Hello, you fuckers. What? I'm here with uh, Demo Michel, the infamous Demo Michel, my dear friend and uh, my benefactor and uh, all the rest of it, my Taoist uh, and not-so-Taoist <laughs> guru and all this other jazz. So I've cornered him uh, with this Disco Ganesha to ask a couple of questions um, that I think will be very insightful and um, I would like to hear more about it. So here we go. Oh, thank you very much, Joey. So cool. So I'm going to start with... Yeah. Um, I know that you've trained with many teachers, but when people say, including myself, when I've trained with many teachers, I don't think that um, <laughs> it is quite as extensive as the way you have trained with your many teachers. So, um, because you have trained with these teachers in a traditional setting, in a very traditional way, most of the time living with them and things like that. A lot of the time, yeah. yeah. I would love to hear your take on what it was like to learn from these many teachers in China. I mean, you, you had the opportunity to train with some really special people, so would love to hear a bit more about uh, your experience, what it was like to train with these people day in, day out, and uh, and all the fun stories and all the rest of it. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I would say if I've had lots of teachers, I, I would categorize them into two headings. So I would say that I've had a few teachers that are the trunk of the tree, mm -hmm. if you like, the mainstay, and then many of the other teachers that I've, I've met, um, for various reasons, not, not always because I didn't feel their skill was very good, not at all, sometimes it just wasn't a match, but many of the other teachers I saw for brief periods of time around it, around this sort of core. So mm -hmm. I would say the main teachers I've had have been one, two, three, four, maybe like, yeah, okay, still a few, maybe like six, yep. or, or something, yeah. Yep. And then the others I visited, yeah. Cool, so what it was like training with your main teachers? Yeah, well, I I guess growing up with a family martial artist, I was used to the idea of if you go to see a teacher, if you've decided that's the person that's going to teach you, which also means they have to decide they want to teach you too. There's, yep. there's definitely that, and I messed that up a couple of times. <laughs> but if, if that decision has been made, then because I grew up around martial arts, I always associate that kind of training with living with or spending a lot of time with a teacher. So, in not every case, but in the majority of cases, I got to know my teachers' families and very close and went to either live with them in their house, uh, which has its ups and its downs, as you can imagine, um, or, or I got hold of a property next to where they lived, as close as I could without stepping over into personal boundaries, yep. um, so that I could spend as much time with them, yeah. So, I... It's only through recently, really, that I didn't know that that's not what other people did yeah. these days. I had no idea, because when I'm teaching the, the people who come to study with me, of course, I have people on workshops and courses. But then the closer students, all right, I have had them live with me, but these days I don't do that anymore. But I still have a huge amount of interaction with them to try to replicate that kind of living student mm -hmm. situation. With them. Yeah, so these days, like these days when people say that I've been with, with a teacher for six years, maybe yes. that within the six years they had like maybe three workshops, yes. or maybe maybe six workshops, so it's a ten workshops, so two days each, so like 20 yeah. days of training in like six years, right? And yes. a lot of it is in public workshops and not one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of sort of, in a way, it's sort of insincere to say you've been with a teacher for six years, because realistically over a six-year period you've been with them for 20 days. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, there's, well, if we look at that way of learning, there's been teachers that I consider the peripheries, yep. people that I've been to visit, that I've met three times, maybe over the space of four or five years. I, I could think of a few like that. I would not count them as my teachers particularly. I would say they were people I went to see. No, a teacher is someone that you, that they have a personal investment in helping you to develop or learn their art to the highest degree you possibly can, so the investment from them is a lot of time. Uh, so no, I would, I would have, you'd have to spend a lot of time with a teacher to consider them being a main part of your path, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, like I, I know some very really good practitioners, like they would spend like maybe a few, like when you're re at a very high level, yes. you can of course spend less time with the teacher and then still yeah. Yeah. get a lot. 
Yeah. But when it comes to your foundation method, like even no matter how skilled you are, I guess you should have foundation method and some accountability to some teacher, right? Like because at the end of the day, like a lot of the time with these things, what I see is zero accountability in these arts. Like there's no teacher and there's no peer validation whatsoever, no peer feedback. So yes. people can literally hang themselves with their own rope in the sense that they consider them to be at the pinnacle of what they do, yet they get no feedback from a teacher or trusted peers. It's, it's a dangerous situation, I think, in to never have anybody that, it's the wrong word maybe, but supervises you? I don't know what you would say. Well, the count, hold, you, hold you accountable, yes. right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you, you, almost have, you always must have someone that does that. I mean, if I look at my personal situation, I, I have... Uh, one main teacher these days that, mm -hmm. that would correct me on certainly the, my technique and skill and, and those kind of things for sure and <laughs> I could always bow to that person's knowledge on everything I then also have a teacher that is very hot on the decisions I've made with regards to the school so there are many when I go to see him which is a few times each year these days this particular mm -hmm. teacher I would say the majority of our time is spent actually talking about what I've done over the year why I've done it studying motives the rationale for it to make sure that what I'm doing is not overly self-orientated or self-centered or going down the wrong path. So you always have that. And sometimes, you know, I will say if my credit is normally happy, but sometimes <laughs> I've had to make some small redirections on yeah. my behavior because he would say that that's not in the right way. And then I also, I mean, I'm lucky my family are obviously involved in, in martial arts. And I would say that, that my dad being a, a, a very strong person on ethics and morals would pull me up if I were to ever, uh, you know, go down a dodgy path. So, I, I, but I think it, I don't ever want that to change. I want that group of people that I run decisions by, and I think it would be dangerous for any teacher to not have that those group of people, like I say, that hold you accountable. Yeah, and I, I think, I think for any human being, even in yeah. normal life, right? I mean, for any human being, it makes sense to actually have some feedback to make sure you're not getting your head stuck up your own ass, right? There's I mean. so many temptations out there, Joey. It's required. There's so many fucking temptations. And those people stop you to follow in those temptations. Yeah, I mean, that's the advantage of living with, with teachers, isn't it? I mean, when I lived with teachers and spent time with them, and it's, my family is a little different because I already kind of do yeah. them anyway, yeah. right? But then, I mean, well, they said that I grew up with my, my dad and, and my mother who were teaching, but then I moved to where my uncle lived to carry on my training with him in a different mm -hmm. art. And then when I went to China, I lived in the, the house of, of, of a couple of teachers, uh, Ni Wenhai initially, and then and Wang Hai Tao mm -hmm. for a period after, a long period after this. And the advantage of that was a couple of things. One, I got to know who that person was, because you don't know who someone is in a class. You yes. don't know who somebody is on video. Yes. I might not be as charming as I come across <laughs> right now, and, or whatever, you know, like you don't, so you get to see how they live their life and how they interact with people and how they treat people, and also the same. Yeah, they get to see. So it works both ways, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they get to double check that they don't feel I'm someone who's going to what undermine what they're doing or, or do a bad job of it or or misuse what they're teaching you. Completely. It could be, it could be a range of things. Actually, yes, yeah. that's you know talking about morals and ethics. Mm -hmm. I know that there's been conversation lately about certain teachers putting their students at risk. They. Oh by basically not vetting the other students that these people train with and exposing them to dangerous right. black characters, risking some of the vulnerable students. And there's all also the situation where some teachers have been behaving in a very unteacher-like manner, sexually propositioning would-be students or existing students and just basically getting involved in their relationships and putting, sending them down the wrong path like essentially justifying their own personal proclivities that are not healthy as what it is that they should be doing to the students themselves. Right. So obviously those things are not healthy. But um, I wanted to discuss a bit more about your thoughts about the responsibility of the community of students. So I mean, I, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been uh, quoted a few times online saying that you know especially in the Tai Chi world, a lot of these people would basically sell their own mothers to a rapist to understand a secret <laughs> that will help them throw, the other, throw others around a little bit better, right? So 
what is your thought on this in terms of the responsibility of the fellow students to ensure that people that they train with their Kung Fu brothers and sisters or Qigong brothers and sisters, mm. especially the vulnerable ones or especially the ones who need a bit more sort of a bit more support right. that they are protected from either senior students or teachers who are going to basically exploit them. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, well, can I approach it in a roundabout manner? Uh, uh, yeah, go for it. Well, I think the first thing is it's definitely not a new, a new phenomenon, is it? Yeah, you know, not at th all. This has been going on since since I was, I mean, I started training in 1984, it was going on then, as soon as I became old enough to become aware of it, mm -hmm. it was the norm, sadly, I would say, it wasn't the norm, it was common yeah. in classes, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably gone on for hundreds of years as well, and uh, that's not to defend it, because it should definitely stop now, I think maybe we've reached an age, we're just talking about accountability, where certainly other things within the social sphere have made people within the media and what have you mm -hmm. more accountable for their behavior mm -hmm. I'm sure you know what I mean yep I'm sure culturally this should extend into the martial arts scene for sure yes yes I think my first view on the relationship between teachers and students which is before we get to students and students which is definitely something very relevant to me because something I have to give a lot of thought to yeah it's one thing I'm aware of if no matter what I'm teaching no matter how well I know the people that have come there to learn I am in a position of greater power than they are so whether someone's vulnerable or not, and of course there are a lot of vulnerable people that come into these arts mm -hmm. often because no matter how we like to present them, there are people that in their mind have projected onto them that this is a thing that's gonna save yes. me. So you will get that for sure. But even if someone's not vulnerable, they're still disempowered compared to the teacher. Yes. Which means that we have a great responsibility because there is a huge amount of influence that we can exert onto students. So yes. the reason I mention that is because one of the examples you gave is getting involved in other people's relationships. Mm -hmm. Which comes up a lot because people will ask me, for example, advice on their relationships, mm -hmm. and advice on their business, advice right. on their... Clearly they don't know me because they'd ask me for <laughs> advice on their investments as well, right. which is an absolute... That's not the wrong place yeah. to ask. But I, I always have a rule that I'm aware where my boundaries of what I'm teaching end. I'm here to teach this art as best I can, mm -hmm. and I'm here to guide, but I'm never there to get involved in people's personal lives. Mm -hmm. So I don't think any teacher should ever give advice on somebody's personal life or their marriage or their relationship or anything yeah. like this. It's all getting involved simply because you don't know their relationship, you don't know their their marriage, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, and when it comes to personal matters, your values might not be right for them, right? Absolutely, and you, and I always hear this thing of, I know it's not a bugbear for you, but it is a little bit for me, you hear people think, well, I help them ask the right questions. Yeah. You hear that phrase, which means you've led them to take the choice you think is right in a manipulative fashion yes. with zero accountability. So yes. I, I think that as teachers, we should stay out of those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I get it, right? I mean, yeah. people do it all the time, right? You, you seek validation for your own actions by yeah. other, the adoption of the same actions or the same values by others. But the thing is, when you're a teacher in a position of influence, it's a little bit different to the average person, right? Yes. So yes. this is why I think that um, teachers must be very careful about that. But in terms of students, like, um, so that my main uh, cons my main, main question was along the lines of sure, what yeah. do you think should the student conduct should be? in terms of creating a safe, protected environment for fellow students. Right, well I don't think students should put up with any crap. That's the first thing, and I think the complication is that every student will have a different view of how a teacher should act. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first caveat yep. to it. But I think there should be shared values across the community, if such a thing exists, across the martial arts community, across the Qigong community, of things that we don't place as acceptable. So for example, I was once at a school that I wasn't training at extensively, I was just visiting it, and there was a couple of little uh, puppies. Mm -hmm. And the puppies were super cute, and I it's sort of straight, but they were a pain in the ass. They were on your trouser yeah, leg while yeah. they're trying to do the forms. You lift the puppy out, put it back, it runs back by yeah. a second. No big deal. And I watched the, the teacher, a famous teacher, walk up, pick up that puppy, and throw it off the mountain. That was what Whoa. he did. Yeah, killed the dog, like that. And then went back to his class, and I, and I was upset. And I will say I didn't Naturally. handle it, and it was the end of my time in that particular yeah. school, and maybe I didn't leave in the most diplomatic fashion, because yeah. you know what I'm like, and I don't put up with stuff like yeah. that. 
But I did watch most of the other students who were there blink, oh, no, 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 I didn't see it, and blinker it, and then afterwards, around a, a dinner table afterwards, justifying that behavior. So all sorts of discussions arose about the karmic level of a puppy versus a spiritual master versus <laughs> the needs of the people. And, and, and all I thought was, all right, more fuckwits. That was the conclusion I come to. But so that, to me, was a, a strong example of when students compromised a very clear moral. If you don't kill puppies, that should be, you know, yeah, uh, given. Exactly. But they were willing to overlook that behavior to so that the person they had projected all of these guru-like traits onto wasn't smashed in their eyes. And then the result was that I would say that creates an abusive relationship between the teacher and the student. And also clearly allows a fucking dickhead to carry on teaching a class. Well, exactly. So the responsibility of students, I think, sorry, I know I'm answering this around, but why I'm trying to be diplomatic, should be <laughs> that, first. Well, sometimes I try. <laughs> I, I, I think the students should have shared values, as in, no teacher should be able to physically, financially, sexually, psychologically take advantage of or abuse somebody within a teaching space, yep. as no other student should be able to do to another student. I think abuse should be gone, and I think that all students should not put up with that. That should be a standard across the board. And I think a part of the reason that doesn't happen is because there's a lot of projection upon teachers where they want that teacher to be a paragon of perfection in yes. their eyes. And, and often, that's not the case. Okay, so just, just so that we are clear, what you're saying is that suggesting a student that you should borrow their sex dolls instead of having a meaningful relationship with another human being is not okay. I, I mean... No, <laughs> there's not many ways I can answer that. A teacher asking the student to borrow their sex dolls would seem like several degrees of mental illness and deviance all rolled into one situation. Or like, you know, every time you have, a pro if have an argument with your girlfriend, the teacher basically suggests that you go to hookers and then, you know, like praise if you go to hookers with other students or call you a pussy if you don't go to hookers. I, I would that say kind of shit, right? Like, I, I mean, I would say if that kind of behaviour is going on, then it should not be going on. No, no, and I think that that that, that should be eradicated. Well, I mean, I've spoken about this a little bit before, and, and it's not always a popular view, but you can't be taught something by somebody without adopting some of their characteristics. Yes. It's just a fact. Especially oh. in the internet. One second. second. I have to. These guys are up. Okay. Go cool, quick. Now it'll look like you said something really bad. I did it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I can apologize. You can make on. Oh, no, I can just basically pretend. Uh, sorry about that for the cut. <laughs> Somebody wanted my attention there. Yeah. And um, so what were you saying? Uh, uh, uh. You were saying about like... Um, oh, right. Yeah. If, if yes. Uh, whoever teaches you something, you're going to be influenced by them. Mm -hmm. I think it goes... I think if you... At school, it starts with your English teacher, your history teacher, your geography teacher. They will influence you to a certain extent, that's for sure. I think that's why a, a good teacher can be very influential or a bad teacher on somebody when they're younger. But then obviously when you go into something like Qigong or Tai Chi or meditation or, or whatever, as well as any subtler levels of esoteric yep. transmission that may take place, although that's quite rare within these arts these days, there's also the fact that the more you project upon that person as your guru, within you, the sort of plasticity of your mind, you're more likely to adopt their traits. So you, the student needs to be aware that who you train under will influence you. That's right. And, and the uh, teacher needs to be aware of the same. Yeah, that's right. So because, you know, the human brain is very leaky, right? Like, so when but someone looks at another person <laughs> who has the kind of skills that you would like to have, you s perhaps unconsciously even yes. model them, right? Yeah. And when you model someone else, you and if you're exposed to a range of their behaviors outside of this particular skill, it is more likely than not that you'll be modeling those behaviors to a certain extent too, and uh, this is where the yes. danger is. 100%. If you're going to get involved in someone's life and you're teaching something, then you've got to understand that even if you stay out of their personal life, your existence and your proximity to them will probably cause them to adjust a little bit to become more like you, whether you like it or not. And that's where the responsibility needs to be adopted by both teacher and student, yeah. 
I agree. Thank you for uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts openly about this because even people who have who share these thoughts sometimes don't want to share these thoughts because right. they're worried about repercussions or bad business environment or and things like that. Oh no! So no. thank you for sharing these thoughts uh, openly and honestly. And speaking of which, um, can we? talk about some of the misconceptions that we discussed about the nature of Qigong, the mistranslations and the misconceptions, because uh, a lot of the things that get translated from the classics or Tao Te Ching or whatever it might be, when you actually engage in the practice, a lot of the mainstream translations, they make absolutely no sense at all. So, and this is a fundamental thing, these are the classics, right? So these are sort of like the in a way, the highest level of authority outside of practitioners who have been practicing, even even in parallel to them, yes. that people look into. And the fact that they don't make any sense at all, or they're metaphorical or mystical, it, it creates a lot of, at the very least, it creates cognitive dissonance. And in the worst case, people go down the wrong path. Yes. So uh, could you share a little bit about those translations, the very fundamental things that we spoke about before? Mm. Yeah, so... I think with tr translations is a is a is a tricky thing because as you, you're more than aware of, uh, I'm sure. I know you've gone quite deep into exploring the Tai Chi classics, mm -hmm. particularly. But translating it is one step of understanding it, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you translate a word directly across, it doesn't necessarily mean you understand it. So yes. there's also the context within which that word appears, of course, yep. um, and then. Then there is, obviously, especially with the Chinese, there's a certain degree of nuance towards understanding many of these phrases that can only happen in the context of correct practice anyway. Mm -hmm. So generally, I would say that even if the texts were translated accurately, I still needed the guidance of teachers. Uh, I, I mean, specifically, I have to give thanks to a teacher, Wang Haitao, for helping me a great deal mm -hmm. with understanding some of these. Um, and Qigong, in particular, there's not a lot of classics actually yes. about Qigong, not compared yeah. to Tai Chi. But there are some phrases, and there's things like the Yi Jing Jing and the Ji Shui Jing, but some phrases are core. So the one we were talking about is the Yi leads the Qi, mm -hmm. or, or as it's often translated in the West, like where intention goes, energy flows. Yeah. Is that what they translate some, it? Some new age bullshit. Something like, like that. Yeah, yeah. But that, that phrase. But so this one, Yi leads the Qi, to me is the key for Qigong. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to get too nerdy about it, but uh, essentially the, the E means the shape of the mind, mm -hmm. right? Uh, sometimes people will say it's intention or it's in thought, but it's not. There's a more correct term with it, which is Enian, which means a kind of passive and active actions of the mind together. Mm -hmm. And if E is used on its own in the context of Qigong specifically, it generally means the more passive aspect of your mind mm -hmm. rather than the most active. It's the same in Chinese medicine. The spleen is responsible for the as mm -hmm. in the, the passive, receptive aspect of mm -hmm. the mind. So if you take that as the meaning of Yi, and then Yi Dao, Qi Dao, Dao means the kind of fruition of a journey, and then Qi obviously means the production of this energy within the body. Mm -hmm. So actually Yi Dao, Qi Dao means, or, or the Yi Dao, Qi as they normally translate it, means the result of converting your mind to the correct state, that it develops a passive quality, meaning a passive level of attention, mm -hmm. the more the fruition of this is that your body produces chi. Right. That's what the phrase means. So if I simplify that down and paraphrase it, it means if you can develop a high degree of attention, free from intention, then your body will start to produce chi. And that is the key to qigong practice. Right. So so does like so to me it sounds like it is very consistent with my, the mind fl fluid soaking the tissue. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So um so can you um, share a little bit of your own experience and your insight into the, um, the experience that I personally have and a lot of people have had that I've spoken to about Qi being the interface between the communication between the mind and the body? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, uh, one, defini one translation for Qi is the fluid of the mind, isn't it? Uh, and I see that's becoming more, more common. Yeah. And I think that's a really good translation of it, actually, mm -hmm. certainly a certain level of practice. Because if the mind and the body don't have the intermediary of qi, mm -hmm. then I would say what you're left with is contractive, hinge-like movements, basically the sort of normal brain nervous system yeah. contract. If you have 
a large amount of qi and it starts to build, then the malleability of the mind is reflected in the malleability of the body. Mm -hmm. So this is where it becomes a bit of a double-edged sword, because if you have a lot of qi but your mind is all messed up and you're living in a constant state of, I don't know, anguish, for example, yeah. that is going to translate via the fit of the qi into the body, meaning your body will start to right. reflect that. And because there's a feedback loop, then your body will feed back into the mind. So in this way, building more qi can be problematic. But if you can work with your mind in the right way, so that it, the E is refined through cultivation, then the result is your body will transform in a way that becomes more efficient for spiritual practice, energetic practice, something like this. So, so I would think that this is the reason why a lot of traditional systems have, at the very least, a set of ethics that a person should yeah. operate within, or a set of precepts. Yes. And then from within that, some of the traditions go more into the direct mental work in refining your perception and things like that, right? Yes. And, it, and you have at the same time, in order for the ethical, moral, precept teachings yes. to have their function upon you, you have to have a, a desire for them to have an act upon yes. you. It, it <laughs> I've, I've been to teachers and say I've been to, I don't know, a Buddhist teacher giving a, a talk on Dharma and about morals or the way you should be. And I've been with other people, you know, and I've gone and I've heard and I've come away thinking, that makes a lot of sense. And, there, and there's something is sparked in me, like there's a passion in me for ensuring that those moral teachings are integrated into myself. Mm -hmm. And that very sort of pact I yes. enter into with that teaching already starts to reconfigure the mind. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. And yep. if there's a lot of chi, it starts to reconfigure the body as well. Yep. And, and now there is a teaching, yet I've, that has changed you. Yet I've been with other people who've gone and they've heard and they've come away and they've gone, well, that was nice, but I'm still the same. And they haven't <laughs> realized that the power is not in the precept or the moral teaching. The power is in you. It's speaking to you in such a way that you actually have a passion, if you want. People won't like that word, you know, but a, 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 an intention for that to have a power in you. Then the two will work together. And in that way, then, then precepts and morals become the core. They take the edges off of the shape of your mind mm -hmm. till such a stage where your cultivation could go deep enough that you reach a level of equanimity where something else will arise. And at that stage, the morals and the precepts aren't really needed anymore because right. there's a kind of truth instead. But you have, to, you have to have the safety net of those morals first, yes. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, I've been, been, been around people, I mean, you being one of them, annoyingly, <laughs> yes. uh, who have a very strong alignment to their own values. Like people may state what their values are, but doesn't necessarily mean they're aligned with them the way you're okay. saying. They're committed yeah. to yeah. it. Yes. So it's not reflected in their minds or bodies. It's just you know lip, lip service, right? Yeah. But there's people like you who basically very strongly align with their values, and interestingly, I've noticed that it creates this sort of environment around them where it rubs off on people. <laughs> for the okay. lack of a better word. Or it annoys them. Well, yeah, fair. I mean, I can see that. Yeah. Or both. <laughs> or both, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so can you talk a little bit more about that? I know we talked about somatic empathy and things like that. So, right. but, yeah. uh, but it's like, it's something that I really noticed. It's like, when I'm, with a, when I'm with a certain teacher, I feel like uncharacteristically calm. And not because of any of my doing. It's because they have such an alignment with stillness and calmness. So with you... When I'm around you, I feel a very strong alignment towards a certain set of values and ethics. Okay. So, um, can you talk a little bit more about that? The yeah. mechanism behind it, in your view? Well, firstly, thank you. If that's how I am experienced, then I'm happy with that, because mm -hmm. I do value my moral code. Mm -hmm. Something's important. I would also say beforehand that I do slip up occasionally, like <laughs> everybody does. Not to the extent of the examples you gave earlier. I mean... <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm a particularly deviant person, but uh, I, yeah, I, maybe I can't take credit. Out of all the teachers I had, my father hammered into me a very strong moral code when I was very young and a set of values. So these ideas of honesty and integrity are very important to me. So if I were to espouse a, a, a value or a, a moral that I wasn't personally in line with, I'll be honest, the the contrast between the lack of truth I was living and what I was saying would cause me pain, mm -hmm. to be honest. I, it would actually hurt me, um, and it would cause a kind of suffering that I couldn't live with. So 
Therefore, I have two options, which is to either give up morals or to move myself in line with those morals, mm -hmm. and, and that's where I feel most, most comfortable. Mm -hmm. I think that in a world of a world that allows you to self-justify the majority of most behavior because being selfish and being prideful and being um, abusive is now no longer seen in such a negative light as it used to be. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more exceptions for such things. I think it's extra important that people within a, the field of cultivation develop and adhere to very strong morals. Mm -hmm. So the biggest enemy of your moral code, in my opinion, is self-justification. Mm -hmm. And self-justification is dishonest. And yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I, maybe it's not even, maybe I'm, I'm hardly high-minded. I, I literally have to follow that moral code because it hurts me. Maybe I watch Pinocchio too many times. <laughs> But Jiminy Cricket's a motherfucker for me. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. Yes, yeah. He's, Jiminy Cricket's got a fucking sledgehammer in my ear. And I want it to remain that way. And with regards to somatic empathy, what you're talking about, you're referring to, is the ability for one person's nervous system and neuroplasticity, maybe that's a word, to pick up off of somebody else. And I believe that somebody's moral code is as much as part of who they are as their ethnicity or mm -hmm. their gender or whatever you know and, and so those things are going to rub off onto people yes and I, I'm proud to say pride is bad I'm proud to say <laughs> that I think even the people that I teach who may not be the the greatest warriors on earth or, or whatever or any of these things or maybe that's what they want to be who knows the vast majority of them have a very strong moral code mm -hmm. and, and I'm sad to say a lot of them are quite disgusted by a lot of the behavior that goes on in the Qigong and Tai Chi world right I mean unsurprisingly really and um yeah, and then uh, and um, and the other thing we we're discussing was that about like as you develop chi, how it um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> the shit magnifier. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, well, more chi equals more you. Right. So in the same way that if somebody is from a medical point of view, yep. has no chi, they would be wasting away, right? Right. I mean, right. they would waste yeah, away health wise. Yeah. Same the same with your personality as well. Right. So when I was younger, I was a lot more angry and frustrated, mm -hmm. for sure. Like many young men who have too much testosterone and yep. not enough brains, I was quite frustrated yep. and quite angry. And the problem was I was also quite good at building chi. So yep. as, as I managed to fill up the body and generate yep. a lot of this energy inside, I will say it made my level of frustration and annoyance a lot higher. Right. So I don't think at that era, that phase in my younger years when I was training, I don't think I was the best influence on people around me. Right. And, uh, and I'm first to admit that because the more chi exaggerated my behavior until I became a caricature of this sort right. of person. I, I will say that I was lucky enough to have insight into that. And also some, some of those people that held me accountable, mm -hmm. who gave me a hard time, who showed me that and then there's, a, there's that balancing act, so then you have to have the cultivation to temper the, that part yep. of your character away, so that when you build chi, hopefully a more positive version of you, you comes forward. So I would say that, I know this is a little off your topic of what you're asking, Joey, I, I apologize, but I would say that the difference between a student and a teacher, with regards to their role, a student should have values, and a student that they uphold themselves, yep. and that a teacher they're studying with yep. should adhere to. Uh, not to be abusive, things like yes. this. But a teacher must also have values and also be brutally self-punishing with their self-scrutinization and the standards that a teacher should hold themselves to should be at a very high level. And I don't think that we should ever compromise that at all, simply because of the amount of influence that we're having upon the people that we that we teach. Yeah, so this is um, this is a reasonably frequent argument I have with people when they say, oh, they're human too. Yes, yes, yes they're human, but they're also humans in a very influential position. Mm -hmm. So that creates a little bit of difference, right? Because their impact yes. is felt far and wide because of the influence. Yes, of course. So um, I fully agree with that. And um, Many of the teachers I didn't stay with yeah. was because I... Well, some of them it just wasn't a right fit, so that's yeah. not fair. There's some teachers I've gone to see, then it just didn't, I went somewhere else, you know. Yeah. Oh, cool. But many of the teachers I didn't stay with because even as a fairly strong person, which I believe I am, I recognized that I was going to have to open myself up to that person in order to learn. 
which means that that person is going to have been a greater influence upon my character than I would have liked. Mm -hmm. So as I got to know that teacher, I didn't view them to be mature enough or centered enough or moral enough that I wished to allow their influence upon mm -hmm. how I viewed things. So certainly it looks like, from what you're describing, I mean, yes. of course, I'm sure it was a journey like you described, yeah. the development of the maturity itself, right? But sounds like you've been applying yourself to the, the process of learning these arts in a yes. very mature way. Well, you also fuck it up quite regularly. Well, I mean, that's how you, <laughs> that's how you learn, right? Yes. <laughs> that's yeah, how you, yeah. like, you know, you fuck it up not too bad, <laughs> so you survive another day until you don't fuck it up anymore, right? Yes. That's kind of how learning works. Yeah. So, but um, it sounds like the way you approach yourself with teaching, certainly as of late, right, is in a very mature way. Now, one of the things that I've kind of noticed with, when you look at the general kind of population that gets involved in intel arts, right? It seems like there's a degree of lack of maturity that is required to learn intel arts. I don't mean maturity in just like, you know, in the discernment alone, like things like grit and perseverance and like, you know, like basically suck it up buttercup shit, right? Like complain about every bloody thing on the planet, you know? Sure, yeah, okay, yeah. So um, what's your experience with this, having taught so many people or are teaching so many people? Ah, it's hard to answer me to answer that because obviously the people I teach will take this personally to a certain <laughs> degree. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry to put you in this position. So uh, may maybe make a general remark about the people that you've seen all over the world. Sure. Yeah. I will say, okay, well, first of all, a caveat to that. The people I teach tend to be really lovely, actually. I I'm really happy with yeah. all the people I meet. And generally, the, the, the martial arts world in general are uh, nice enough. Is there a lack of maturity? Yes, I think so. I think that the kind of people that come to the internal arts fall into two categories, introverts and dorks. I right. think that's probably the, the category. And I, I probably fit into both of those categories, to be perfectly honest, so I can say that. I think that... Uh, I mean, if I were to not be so kind and be yeah. brutally honest like say my son or my daughter I would say there's a large percentage of incels who get kind of attracted to <laughs> this type of arts as well. What do you mean by that? In, in what way? I know what an incel is, like an involuntary celibate. Right. It's um, like in the sense that uh, people who they need something, yeah. whether, it, whether it will be company of a female or sex or whatever that may be, right? right. But they kind of Look in looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place, right? Okay. Like they see yeah. the internal arts and the practice of it and the community as some that's something that in some way is going to make their social lives better in what they're lacking. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's fair. I I think that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that when I s the problem with introverts often is. Well, the plus side is you tend to have a high degree of introspection. Mm -hmm. The downside is if you are not someone who holds yourself to a very strong code, you also have a higher degree of self-justification mm -hmm. quite often because you will root out the reasons why you do things. So introverts yep. should always be careful of that. And then the other side of the problem is often with introverts, they're people that have naturally wanted to separate themselves from society a little yep. bit. And that's definitely the quality of the people that come into internal arts. It's definitely myself because I have a, a great distaste for society in general. So if you have that quality, it makes it easier for you to have been someone that slipped through the cracks of responsibility in your community. So I think if there's any, as you're saying, immaturity in the people coming to these arts, it's often that they've been people that have never had to shoulder a great amount of responsibility to a wider community. And I think as a person, a young person, that's the best way to grow, is when mm -hmm. you have responsibility either to a work team or colleagues, or a family, or a community, mm -hmm. or something, I think that helps you grow. So I think a lot of people coming to the internal arts have suffered from that a little bit, is what I'm seeing. Uh, but of course there's exceptions. Yeah, of course, of course exceptions. I mean, there's always exceptions. It's just I was looking at, no, I'm, not, I'm not talking about just the... I'm trying to be nice to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not just talking about the internal arts world, but as you know, like recently I've had some experience with the with certain communities of like, you know, practice like yoga and all the, right. <laughs> all so the sound healing and the ecstatic dance and all this stuff, right? Well, that so brings me to category two, <laughs> dorks, which is <laughs> the second category, which is people, I think a lot of people are just playing out their traumas that they picked up at school. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe trauma is the wrong word, but you know, their psychological yeah. pattern they picked mm -hmm. up at school. So I can't comment too much on the 
yoga or sound bath world, whatever it was you brought because I don't know it that well. I know ecstatic dance is a bit of a shit show. And you visited <laughs> that last night, but I don't know much about it. But I can certainly talk about it in the martial art world that I think what happens is, and again, personally relevant as well. So please never, anyone listening, so I'm not just having to go from a position of not also being within that category. Mm -hmm. But if you weren't very popular at school and you were kind of picked on, you were kind of disempowered, maybe you weren't so popular with the opposite sex, which can be something as basic as you weren't as tall as the other people around mm -hmm. you, or you weren't as physically capable as the other people, those kind of things. Yeah, could be a number of reasons. It could be a number yeah. of reasons. You know, the genetics are a great handicap for many people, yeah. you know, and, and I think that often those people are attracted to a field that they think can give them some kind of power or a need to be to be special in a way that they couldn't feel when they were younger. So therefore, if you can become the best yoga teacher or you can become the most powerful martial artist or you can become the Qigong practitioner with the ability to develop psychic powers and all that, fudging, falls very foul yeah. of this obviously, then that prop that you can get for suddenly having a superpower over other people becomes just a, a wound dressing for the traumas that you felt for not being very attractive at school. And that might sound horribly basic, yeah, but I, I mean think that, that applies to a lot of people. Unfortunately, like, I see that, like, uh, for example, sometimes even some of the more established teachers, like, you know, sometimes... Like when me! <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when they do demonstrations, you yeah. can see that they push it a little too far. Like, obviously the student is, or the demonstration subject, is feeling the fact. Mm -hmm. There's no real need to push it, but they kind of want to push it to sort of, like, rub it in, establish a point really strongly that you're completely dominating this person. I think that if a person still has a desire for power or any benefit from having power over even one human being, they shouldn't be given any tools for having power over other human beings. Well, if that is the case, then, you know, like, large professional <laughs> practitioners of Tai Chi, for example, need to be sent home by their teachers, unfortunately, because at the end of the day, like, you know, this is my personal opinion and experience and I'm talking about in general I'm just yep. I've met some of my best friends and some amazing people to the international martial arts community over the last yes. 16 years but I also experience a lot of people who dress their underlying motivations with high-minded or high horse ideas and like you know doubt aging or you know like all these theories or like of compassion and you know, non-duality is a good one, right? And all these crazy things. But at the end of the day, all they want is to push someone else over so they can feel like a man or a woman, you know, like powerful. Which is an odd aim, isn't it, to push a man over? But <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, look, I, I guess it's easier for me to make it personal. I, I can, because then it, I'm not, it doesn't feel like I'm attacking anyone particularly, but I would all, I was, I'll talk about myself, but I also think it applies to lots of others. Mm -hmm. If I look at the processes I went through through Fajin, as yep. an example, fajin, the ability to, I'm sure anyone watching this knows what fajin is, but the, the kind of fajin where you uproot or yep. mobilize someone. When I first learned it, I was quite young. Mm -hmm. Rebounding jin I learned quite early, right. which is a form of fajin. Yeah. It's an in and that's how you do the first form of fajin uh, that yeah, people yeah. Learn, right? It's yeah. the first time someone touches you yeah. and their feet come up, woof, we're gonna yeah. And I, <laughs> I remember the first time I did it, I was a teenager still. And, uh, and then shortly after that, even some of the deeper energetic stuff, because of Shen Hung Zun, uh, yeah. who was a remarkable teacher and a remarkable chap, mm -hmm. who always wore his sleeves too long, and everybody <laughs> understood him. It was like he was running around in a straitjacket, <laughs> but remarkable human yeah. being. And uh, so I learned quite young, and I remember when I first learned Fajin, and the first time I could knock someone over, and fucking hell, I wanted to do it to everybody, because it did exactly that. It, it covered up this wound I'd had in me for not being a special, as I felt I needed to be in order to validate what society and other people had told me that I right. should be special and I hadn't managed it, I was just a pleb. So when I started to do it, it did stimulate that in me. Right. Then after that, a few years down the line, there was a sense of power that came from it. I enjoyed the sense of knocking someone to the floor and I enjoyed the domination that came from it and I took things too far, definitely. So I would push hands with people and feel that uncomfortable feeling arising in them and especially if they were another male mm -hmm. more than anything which probably healthier than it being the other gender but especially if it was another male I used to hammer that home and, and dominate right. that person so then I went through another stage through self-introspection which I think is what teachers need to do 
is I recognized that, and then I got to a stage where I was uncomfortable doing fajian. Mm -hmm. So therefore, to even uproot somebody's feet made me feel guilty. To even touch someone and take away their strength made me feel like I was doing a bad thing. So I went through this whole phase of like the pendulum had swung to the opposite, yes. and I was uncomfortable with it. And I remember telling my teacher about this, uh, as well as my father discussing it. And, and I remember them saying, oh, this is, let me see, no, you don't need, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Like, you don't feel like that. But I recognized I needed to feel like that. I had to feel that guilt. And I went through that stage, and then the two kind of neutralized each other, I would say, and now I'm ambivalent to it. Like, it's, it's irrelevant to mm -hmm. me. And only at that stage where it became irrelevant to me that I really start to teach it to any large degree, which right. is why my teaching career for years was Qigong rather than Tai Chi. Right, that because makes a lot of sense. Because I had too much emotional investment in, in the whole internal thoughts thing. It, once I didn't care, then it felt like a healthier place to do it. Mm -hmm. But I also recognized that if I touch hands with someone who likes power, I feel that in them, I'm less inclined to teach them push hands. I right. step back, I do not assist them in that thing. They can learn other stuff, but not that thing. And, and I think that that, it's only my opinion, but I think that teachers need to go through that journey, or maybe they're more mature than me, so they don't need to go through that journey, and they've already gone through it. <laughs> I see you sniggering. And then I think that they should adhere to the same thing. I mean, the old idea was if the teacher suspected or intuitively picked up or had evidence of negative character traits from that particular student, then they weren't to be taught. And I've seen enough Shaw Brothers movies. I know what the stereotype of what a teacher's role is, and I, I think that's what a teacher should adhere to. I fully agree, but unfortunately, apparently the current criteria that has been applied is that if you're pleasing to the eye, you want a sexual molester is okay. If you want to be pleasing to <laughs> the eye, you want. <laughs> apparently, if you're ple pleasing to the eye, even a yes. sexual molester is okay to teach. So. <laughs> right, okay. Well, normally, sexual molesters aren't that pleasing to the eye, are they? Yeah, which, 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 <laughs> which models the mind how they became pleasing to the eye, but you know, who knows? You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? I, I think that that I think there should be a greater check on people before you teach them anything. That can give them power over other people. Mm -hmm. I think that, and I've made that mistake in the past and taught people things I shouldn't have done, and you live and learn. I think that you need to get to know students, which is, I think, is why you also need to, if not live with them, spend a lot of time mm -hmm. with the ones you're going to take further into the arts. Right. I think that's important because you need to know those people and you mm -hmm. need to see how they interact with other people. That's the importance of around the school, the social events and the time spent getting to you're watching the students to see mm -hmm. how they interact. So if you want to scale something like like if you want to scale teaching these arts like McDojo, you know, you're kind of better off doing Amory Dote and destroy the groin basically. I like Amory Dote. I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> I Actually funnily enough, yes. Master Ken got a lot of shit from one of in one of the I would say one of the fairly, one of the more bigger Facebook groups. The Yang Family Tai Chi group, you mean? <laughs> yeah, I that saw one. That like people just it's didn't one get of the, the worst jokes. Like on Facebook. they yeah. were losing it over. Like they were like, "How dare this guy who just flags something that he hasn't learned?" I yes. mean, obviously, no one would believe, or maybe some would too. But no, I mean, to me, it's very hard to imagine that someone would believe that, you know, that scenario where Tai Chi came from. Like you know. The yes. need to defend against an army of attacking slots coming down a mountain, right? <laughs> I mean, I think that we live in a time of outrage and uh, poor sense of humor. I think that's definitely the case. So I would imagine that. I was so about. surprised at how many people <laughs> lost their marbles over it. And, you know, even if you didn't know yes. that Master Ken was a comedian, right? Which is pretty obvious. Well, one would think so. Yes. <laughs> but. Uh, but even then, like, you know, the way he was describing it, the mannerisms that he was approaching it, it was clearly satire. Master Ken's funny because I saw him do uh, some some moves on a video. It's actually a pretty good martial artist. He is, well, actually. actually. <laughs> he is. A Meridote aside. Yeah. That's, that's actually <laughs> what makes it even funnier, right? Yes, because yeah. he's very much in touch with what, it's, what it is to be a martial artist. Yes. So the stuff that he does is actually quite, you know, like, yeah, it's quite authentic and hard editing in that way. Yeah, he's given Tai Chi a hard time, which is cool. It's, um, yeah, it was funny. Like, I, I was very surprised that it came to that <laughs> when someone posted that yeah. joke. I think, I think with the other thing you're asking about as well is uh, the other thing you mentioned, obviously, sex offenders. If you have a large group of people, yeah. you are, chances are you're going to have people with various legal issues in yeah. their school. I have people in my school with legal issues. Mm -hmm. I've had some legal issues as well. But because people with legal issues, 
and that's okay. Like I've had people who've committed crimes and that, mm -hmm. but one crime I will not put up with is sexual offences. No, I think that is where a line should be drawn. And if someone has committed numerous sexual offences and there is, uh, well, or even one sexual offence, and there's a legal, you know, they've been charged and everything, that yes, they need to be ousted from a community. Yeah, and I think that uh, in a lot of lo in a lot of other domains where there is a generally accepted level of duty of care, this doesn't yeah. seem to be established norm yet for some reason. In yeah, because I wouldn't expect to get a job in a playgroup or a school or well, something. Well, exactly, Maybe right? Sometimes they do because things go wrong. Yeah. But I would assume the standard is that that's not allowed anymore. And, and especially in situations where people have pointed out that this person has had a problematic past and he will, and going from there to recommending closer interaction between this this potential perpetrator and vulnerable students and from there going to basically interacting with them as a fuck you to the world, no one can tell me what to do. That's like I mean that's kinda of bullshit really because at the end of the day you can you can have all the issues with the world that you have, but you shouldn't put students at risk in trying to resolve them or try to compensate for them. If that's going on, then it should stop and it's bad and it's terrible and yes, it's not right. No. So, um, you know. That's a, that's a baseline standard to me. Don't allow sexual predators into your community. I would assume that is something that was a given. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the case, so there you go. No, I remember in the, the karate world. I remember one association when I was younger, because I've always been in, so even when I didn't run an organization, yep. some the fuck I ended up doing that, but <laughs> I was always in association, organization. Yep. And it was known. I remember there was one guy who had been to prison for fighting, I think, or something, some fuck up when they were younger, yep. and done a lot of years, yep. and then come out and was in the Karate Association, yep. and everyone knew this guy's past, and he was very apologetic and everything like that, and very, very close to many of the heads of the school, yep. and I knew the guy and everything like that when I was a, a younger. And, and then it turned out, actually, that the guy was lying and he'd been inside for having sex with a 10-year-old girl. Right. And as soon as the truth came out, the entire karate association that I was involved in turned on this guy and he was ejected from the organization on the spot, despite previously being very close to some of the heads of it. So the moral code was, as soon as that was discovered, that person was ejected from the group. And there was no questioning of that. That was just the norm. And I, I think if the, that karate organization had kept that person in, A, that would have been terrible, and B, a lot of people, students in that organization would have been very, very unhappy and probably walked away from it. Yeah, as they should. absolutely, as they should have, right? And Chinese arts, I would hope, would hold people as accountable. That's right, and and you know I, I don't believe anyone is beyond redemption, but the fact is that, like I'm I don't I'm not really saying that we should be vindictive and punish people. People should be given the the opportunity to rehabilitate themselves and yes. find redemption. But at the same time, we can't pretend that these people don't have demons that they're struggling with. Well, right? isolate them from the group. Like that's exactly right. You have to isolate them from the group where they can yeah. prey on the vulnerable. If you honestly believe that someone has managed to rehabilitate, mm -hmm. which is possible. Which is not wrong. unreasonable, yeah. If someone has done that, then that's the point of getting to know the students. So then you, you work with them and it's away from vulnerable people. And you work them out. I would be honest. I would say to this person, I'm isolating you from the group for yep. this reason. Get to know them over a period of time and then, and then make a decision from there. That's Me right. personally, I don't have the time or patience for that, so I would just not have them in my group. And but also I think there's a responsibility for the teacher in that scenario to let the other people know that this person has this kind of past yeah. that you're interacting with. But he is obviously, you know, we basically work with them and he's rehabilitated himself. So this is where the person is coming from. So you, how much you want to interact with them or what distance you want to keep from them is your personal choice. Yes. And I'm basically giving them a chance because I feel that they have rehabilitated themselves. Right? That's the mature way of dealing with it. And that way the fellow students, the other students, can make a choice as to how close or how far they want to be from this person, right? Uh, I keep it in the simple, I just remove them from my group, but that's <laughs> the way I would do things. I think that's, you know, it's focusing on one or two issues is almost making it too small because there's, there's many moral and ethical issues yep. that have gone on in the scene and it's part, part of the problem it'll never be s solved because it's part of the problem with no overarching 
set of standards yes. for the martial arts or Qigong scene. And, yes. and they have tried to bring some in. I know in Japanese martial arts and some of the organizations have tried to bring in these standards. But the problem is the counter to that is when they bring in rules, they also start to bring in other rules as well that the yes. teacher has. That, and then you next thing you have a takeover. So it's one of the, the greatest strengths of the Chinese martial art world is that it has no overriding set of governance, but also is the most dangerous thing as well. Yes. That's why, if anything, brings you back to what you were saying, that the feeling in the community in general should hold you accountable. And for someone like myself, who, whether I want to admit it or not, I, I have a fair degree of power in other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Not world domination power, thankfully, because I'm sure I'd fuck up the world within about <laughs> 10 minutes. But I have power over some people. And, yeah. and because of that, I have to be accountable to somebody mm -hmm. as well as my own conscience as well. Yeah. 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 Cool, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on that and I'm sorry you might get some negative comments or, you know, okay. people always complain about your views, simply especially people who are somewhat guilty of what we're talking about here will not probably take lightly to what we're discussing here, unfortunately. I don't mind, they're not in my radar, they're <laughs> not in my community. Yeah. But uh, is, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I mean, if people are upset about views, that's okay, it's only my views, you know, I mean, uh, people don't have to agree with it. I, I often find that, you know, like my views matter within the community of the people I teach mm -hmm. uh, on something like that, but outside of that, I don't really have a responsibility to yeah. tailor my views to keep other people happy, and, and if I can run my views through my morals and I still agree with them, then that's all I can do. So in other words, you don't oppress your students, but you are happy oppressing everyone else. Because, you know, disagreeing with me is oppressing me these days, right? Right, okay, yes. I don't know, it all gets too confusing for me. <laughs> the world has gotten too woke for us, I think. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that beautiful note, thank you very much. No, thanks very much, man. And um, would you like to go get some more Indian and kill ourselves? <laughs> no way, man. Last time I went to an Indian restaurant with you, that was, it. My, that was on the toilet. It's all my fault. <laughs> You, you've got a cast iron stomach and I do not. <laughs> well, to be fair, I was like yeah. feeling the effects of it like right after having it too. I think I was like zombified for a while and then for the next two days I was like drained. I don't recommend that restaurant though. Yes. <laughs> so now the most important question, where do we go for lunch? Oh, right. Not Indian. <laughs> fair enough. Cool, cool. Thank you very much, Deva. Thank you very much. And um, I certainly do appreciate your friendship and your guidance over the years. Oh, same. And I hope you appreciate me being a stubborn bonehead <laughs> to some extent at the very least, giving you trouble. That's a part of your charm. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Jay, do you hear that? <laughs> Cheers, man. Thank you. Thanks. Listen to me now.